Baptist. I chose out one of the scriptures I'm going to be using today as uh, our opening scripture to be- help us begin thinking. And as always, we've got our sheets in here that you can fill out. And it's going to be odd today, not only because I drop it, but it's going to be odd because I don't know how it happened, but uh, what should be like A and B is C and D and D and E and F, and there's all kinds of crazy letters in there. Don't pay any attention to that. Just, just fill in as best you can as we get started. But uh, our sermon reading today is Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7, as we're dealing with family and relationships. And this is what God speaks. He says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children, into your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. And we're going to look at this and the the idea of the family unit uh, in a few moments. But first, as we're talking about family, i got a video for you. It's not the same as the others. It's not a a funny one like the other ones were, but it's a very uh, powerful one. And it's just about the support of a family unit. So please enjoy.
interesting, powerful video, Together Has Power. Together, don't run alone. And that's why we have family and the power of family and what's there. And then we're going to look at this later, that idea of support that comes within a family. Can you imagine what it was like, uh, not only the father having to learn how to run triathlons, <laughs> but the, the rest of the family, the other children, and the adjustments they made, the, the wife, the adjustments she had to make to, to make money. To, I mean, it's just all the way around, support of a family in such a powerful way. So welcome back to the Home Improvement Series as we're going to be looking at the value and the very purpose of families. And the goal of the series, of course, is to help us improve our relationships. We started first with the building blocks of a healthy relationship and how powerful that was. And last week we talked about conflict resolution, how to peacefully and, and powerfully uh, resolve conflict in our lives in a positive way. And if you haven't seen those, go to the website, go to the website, and you can find those. And I bet you if you even call into the office, she'll make copies of, of the sheets that you can fill out there as well and get that information. But today we're going to look at this whole idea of the purpose of the family. You know, Genesis 1 and 2 is very interesting as we have this institution of the family. And God designs and starts it first as, you know, Adam, okay, and then it's not good to be alone. And then Eve is there and God begins to bring relationships into being. And then he has this thing called this covenant of marriage. And in the midst of the covenant of marriage, they find there is this aspect of sexuality. And the very goal of sexuality, of course, is reproduction. And they have children, okay, and now guess what's formed? A family unit in this covenant, this relationship that they have. The family unit is really the first institution created by God. Now, as we look at Genesis, and, and uh, Genesis is an interesting book because the book of Genesis, which I think is 50 chapters, I don't know, somewhere in there, uh, covers about 2,400 years of human history, okay? So you can't look at it as like a daily diary of something. But what God has done is he's, he's helped us see in the midst of, of, of history He's, he's put these, these truths that we're supposed to see the story of God and what God wants us to know and understand about, about life, about family, about, about relationships, about covenant, about who God is and all that there is. So, so it's pieces of history that share the story, and there's large gaps of time in the midst of that. So you can't just read it like it just happens you know, right away, one after the other. But this morning, when I talk about family, okay? Here's what I'm talking about. The family unit. Are you ready? The family unit is the nuclear family, extended families, blended families, adoptive families, foster families, combined families, single parent families, multi-parent families, kids, grandkids, nieces, and nephews. Did I leave anything out that you can think of? Okay, that's what I'm talking about. Family, okay? Family. And I think there are four main areas that God has given in purposes to the family unit. And I even had that someone else this week, they said uh, four, four purposes for the family unit, like for every family, you know, how can you do that? I said, well, I believe scripturally, and I believe what God has done is, is, is showing us that the design of the family is for certain things that are universal, and we're supposed to live within them. So here's where we're going to begin. Everybody ready? Uh, number one, family is designed to be a safe haven or a place of security. Proverbs 14, 26, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children, it will be a refuge or a place of refuge and security. Now, it starts with our reverence for God. It's about our surrender to God, our submission to God, and then as we focus on God and live God's ways and God's truth and God's wisdom, what it tells us is that our home will be a secure fortress, that, that a family will not only be a secure fortress, but it will be a refuge, a safe environment even though chaos happens all around. Physically, a safe environment. Emotionally, a safe environment. Mentally, a safe environment. Socially, a safe environment. Spiritually, a safe environment. Now, I'm not going to go through, I could have thrown up statistics and all kinds of stuff, but the reality is this. Uh, this, is, it, this is what's known, it's understood universally, that safe environments foster healthy individuals. Unsafe environments have a negative effect on the physical, emotional, social, and mental health of persons, especially children who are developing. Everybody got that? A safe environment. 
They call it toxic stress when it's not a safe environment, things that we're really not supposed to live in. Developing children are not supposed to live in this, but we want to create this thing that is a safe environment, a secure fortress, a refuge, and a place of security within our homes. Because this toxic stress negatively shapes one's sense of security, one's sense of trust, and one's really, truly, they've done the research, their abilities and their capabilities are, are, are shortened because of this toxic stress in unsafe environments. But I truly believe God wants to continuously put us into the safe environments that are here for us. Not only is the family unit that safe environment, but... It, I've done a lot of research in this. This is not the sermon today, but a freebie you get to have thrown in here. Are you ready? I've done a lot of research on government, okay, and, and the whole idea of God's institution of government into the world, and I believe it's divinely instituted, government is. And the reality is, as you look it up, government's responsibility is to provide peace, to promote goodness, safety, and stability, it is to keep evil in check, punish wrong, to protect the innocent and the vulnerable. Because without a safe environment, things get crazy. Not only in our world, but within family units. So how do you provide a safe place, a safe environment? Number one, actually it's going to be number letter C for you in there. I, don't ask me how that happened. Letter C, it's about meeting needs. We have to meet needs Physically, emotionally, mentally, socially, and spiritually. Physical needs. We provide food, clothing, and shelter and protection in a safe place. That's a physical need that is met. That is a safety place, a safe environment for us. Mental and emotional needs need to be met, which makes it a safe place. Things like unconditional love that is offered. You see, if you offer unconditional love, it's a safe place. If you offer conditional love, it is not a safe place emotionally for a child or for anybody else in a relationship. This is what we deal with. So we're dealing with uh, unconditional love, acceptance, learning how to deal with change and, and failure and mistakes and hurts. It's about how to encourage other people, how to have positive self-esteem, how to know that they feel valued in the midst of that. That becomes a safe environment. And the spiritual needs, well, we'll get to that in just a minute as well. But to teach and train about God's love and grace and lifestyle. So the first ploy that we make a, a, a home, a safe haven, a safe environment, is to meet the needs that are there in every aspect. Now, uh, letter D for you. The other one is what I would call support. You know, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, Two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If they fall down, they help each other up. Uh, they lie down, they can keep each other warm. Uh, one may be overpowered, but two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. I truly believe stability and, and um, the whole idea of a safe environment within family talks about support for one another. Family is a place where we are strengthened and supported and stand for each other. Good or bad, whatever the storms and trials are, we stand together in the midst of it. It's a strength in numbers. Now, me, I grew up in a very close-knit family, and my parents made sure that that took place and it was instilled. And, and my kids will tell you that my brothers are still my absolute best friends in the world because that's just how we are. It was instilled. We supported each other. We can't wait to see each other every time we get a chance to get together. It's just, it's awesome. So, so my best friends are Kathy and my, and my brothers. That's just how it was and how it is today. And we supported each other, man. You messed with one of us, you messed with all of us, really. And, and that wasn't good always for, for some people. And I, I was just thinking of different stories. Like one time, um, just the support of family, um, two of my brothers were we were all at this basketball tournament. I don't remember even where it was, what it was about. And they were on the same team, but like brothers do, they started fighting and arguing, okay? So here they are in the middle of the basketball court. They're kind of yelling at each other. You know, you didn't pass me the ball when you should have. What are you doing? You know, what, all this kind of thing like brothers do. And somebody decided, man, I better go out there and straighten these, these boys out. So he was going to go out and bark orders to them and let them know what was going on. So here my brothers are bickering, and this person comes out and starts saying something to one of the brothers. And it was like, whoop. They both turn on that guy, and they're like, well, what are you saying about my brother? You know, immediately, because we supported one another. That's how it was. In high school, I, 
brothers playing all kinds of sports, could you imagine? And um, playing baseball, and I don't know why coaches do this sometimes, but the coach came up, and, and, and for whatever reason, he said, well, you know, all the places on the, on the, on the field are filled. There's only one spot left that you could, could have to play, and you two brothers are going to have to fight it out and, and see who, who makes it, you know, like he was going to drive a wedge between them. And one of my brothers said, no, that's okay. You can just let him play. I'll, I'll be somewhere else. And it was like the coach, and it, it turns out they both got to play because there was places for him. He just was trying to, you know, what kind of wedge can I drive in there? And they, you're not going to drive a wedge here because we support each other, and it makes it a safe environment. Is your home a shelter, a refuge, and a safe place? Is it a safe environment physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, in every aspect? What changes can be made to make it a safe environment and a refuge and a place of security? See, this is important because without having a safe place and a safe environment, these other things aren't going to be happening within the family unit. So number two... Family is designed, I believe, to be a life-learning center where we learn about life. Proverbs 6, 6 through 7, these are the commands I give you. Impress them on your children. You know what that word literally means? It's like to bite down on a soft wood and make an impression into it. It's, it's there forever. Like I told the first service, don't bite your children. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you just to make that impression so powerful that it never leaves them. It's in them. Impress these things into your children. Talk about them when you sit, when you walk, when you lie down, when you get up, all these things. Proverbs 22, 6, you raise up a child in the way that, it, that the child should go, and even in later in life, they will always return to it. They will always follow along with what's there. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, that we had read, interesting uh, conversation there. It talks about families, and, and the good part, and just for the younger ones here, it says, children, here's, here's the great uh, commandments that are given. Children, here's one that has a blessing with it, obey your parents because it comes with a blessing. Life will be good for you if you do. See, that's a powerful, powerful thing, okay? Yeah, I see that. <laughs> um, but also it says, parents, don't exasperate your, your children. And in the midst of that, I looked that up. It means to irritate, to annoy. It said one, one definition said to drive them up the wall. That's not your goal in the midst of this. You're supposed to be sharing with them the truth. Or maybe Luke 2.52, which says, Jesus grew in wisdom, intellectually, in stature, physically, in relations with, with other people, socially, and in relation with God, spiritually. See, Jesus, from the time he was a young boy until the time he starts his ministry, he's involved in this family unit, and he grows in all these aspects. And he learns because it's a life-learning center for him to get there. Because family is the context in which the next generation establishes lifelong habits where we develop character, where children become well-adjusted, productive adults who contribute to community, uh, to, to uh, the nation, and literally to, to the church and, and to the world and the kingdom of God. But it's about parents and parent figures. We are the ones given the task from God to instruct and train our children intellectually, physically, socially, spiritually. This task gets benefited from schools. They help. That's awesome. Teachers. I got a whole family full of them. It's helped from, from churches. That's a great thing. It's helped from grandparents and aunts and uncles and whatever you are. That's a great thing too. But parents, we are charged, given that responsibility from God, to share these truths and make them real in our children's lives. Because if we don't do it, I guarantee you, that void is going to be filled in by somebody else. And it can be filled in by Beyonce or Jay-Z or Mark Zuckerberg or, or Katy Perry or Eminem. I guarantee you it'll be somebody other than you. And if you want them raising your children and giving the values to your children, well, go ahead and do that. Not my children, okay? I'm responsible to help them be who they need to be. Parenting's hard, but it's worth it. Because it's where you learn all the basic skills of life, not just to walk and talk and share, but how to interact, how to fight, love, support, follow God, whatever it is. Because the reality is, you don't want to end up like this cartoon here. Um, it, it says, 
look, honey, we're sorry, this is their daughter. We're sorry, if we'd have known you were going to be a writer, we'd have been better parents, right? It's kind of that idea. And you can't read the book, but the name of the book is My Miserable Life, okay? So, so here's My Miserable Life. She's writing it out, and they're like, well, if we'd have known you were going to talk bad about us, we'd have been better parents. I mean, well, how do we know? But we don't want it to be that way, right? So I guess it would be letter D for you. When we're talking about family designed to be a life learning center, it's where we learn about God and the godly lifestyle, where we're instructed and trained, which means it doesn't come natural, but we have to instruct and train. And I told the story in the nine o'clock service. I said, if you put an 18 month old, or actually two 18 months old, in, in a room by themselves and you put one toy between them, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think they're naturally going to go, let's just share. You take the first half hour. I'll sit here and watch you, and then we'll see how that works, right? Is that how children behave? No. We have to teach them and train them on how to live and what's the right way and what good values are and everything else that's there. See, instruction is about your words of teaching. Training is about helping them live it and living it yourself. Letter E. It's where you learn about life and relationships and how to relate to one another. I grew up reading this poem, which is an interesting thing. I'm sure many of you have seen it before, uh, how a child learns. If a child lives with criticism, they learn to condemn. You ever seen this one before? They live with hostility, they learn to fight. With ridicule, they learn to be shy. With shame, they learn guilt. But if they learn with tolerance, patience, encouragement, confidence, praise, appreciation, fairness, justice, security, faith, Approval, self-esteem. See, the whole idea is what you live is there for you. Dysfunction simply perpetuates itself, but good values and good behavior actually perpetuate themselves as well. But we have to try and uh, really intentionally break cycles of dysfunction because we model for and teach and train our children every day, whether it's intentional or unintentional. I want you to know that. Every day. What are you modeling? Are you modeling how good relationships work? Things like forgiveness, openness, vulnerability, unconditional love, how to respond to people, how to, how to get along with people. I guess that leads us to letter F. I guess it is I'm here. It's where we learn character and values. I think probably we catch character as much as we're taught it. Honesty, integrity, work ethic, kindness, patience, unconditional love. We learn about what is important in life and values. Right and wrong, good and bad. And I believe 24-7 we model the values of this world. We model the values of, of money. We, value, we model the values of sex. We model the values of relationships, of success, of failures. And, and this sometimes is a hard one for me because really in all my bad habits and my dysfunctions and my flaws and all my broken places, I've always said, man, I do not want to pass these things on to my children. And guess what? I look back and I go, ooh, I've begun to pass them on. But it's a decision to try and do better, and, and it's never too late. So is your home a positive learning center? What are you teaching intentionally or unintentionally to your children? What values and priorities are you showing as important? Number three, family is designed to be a place of, are you ready? Discipline. A place of discipline. A balance of nurture and discipline. Good, appropriate discipline is necessary. That passage in Hebrews simply says that, that God loves us, and because God loves us, he disciplines us. He shows us the errors of our ways, the things that are wrong, and he disciplines us so that we know what is right and how to live the right way. And in the same way, parents are to do that. We're to follow what God does. It shows us that error and the right way to go how we're supposed to live. And, and discipline is always for the good and the benefit of that person being disciplined. Discipline is always based out of love, out of what is right, to teach them what is right or wrong. Eh, oh well, it's stuck. 
not anymore. Proper discipline is always based out of love and what is best for the other person. And not just negative discipline, but positive stuff as well. If there's positive behavior or whatever's there, it's celebrated. So when we think about discipline, remember we don't discipline out of anger. I'm mad. I'm going to discipline you so I feel better because that's not the purpose of discipline so that I feel better. It's about that other person. We don't discipline as a means to tear a person down or to shame them because we're supposed to build them up and instruct them. And just remember this one, parents. This is a good one. We discipline in a safe environment, meaning they know the boundaries. Those boundaries are consistent and that there's consistent punishment if they go across those boundaries. That's important. How are we doing with the discipline and balance with nurture in our families? And finally, the last one. I believe family is a place to simply enjoy life together. Could you imagine that? God wants us to enjoy life and have fun. Ecclesiastes 3, he writes, I've concluded there's nothing better than, you know, to be happy. Enjoy ourselves as long as we can. Eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of our labor. This is the gift from God. Or Proverbs 17 tells us a cheerful heart is good medicine. It's good for the soul and the heart. Life is short, folks, and so is family time. I mean, we have kids till they're, what, 18, 21 in the home, and they're gone. (laughs) But I believe God wants us to enjoy life. God wants us to enjoy the family time of life. Don't take things so seriously. And I know there are serious things in the world. We've got to take some things seriously. But, man, don't take everything so seriously. Let the work thing go and spend a day with the family. I've sat by many persons on their deathbeds, many. Never once have I heard someone tell me, Preacher, I wish I would have spent less time with my loved ones and family and more time at the office. That's what I really should have done. Never. But I've heard the opposite many times over. Regret. I told in the first service, I said, Don't make me start singing Cats in the Cradle. I hear Chapin. Everybody under 30, Google it, and then you'll know what the song's about. Take vacation time. Go to the park. Go fishing. Go swimming. Go for walks. Go kayaking. Take bike rides. Play games. Create memories and just have fun. Things are so serious today. People are so wound up. They're so on edge. There's so much pressure in this world, especially even for children, little children today. I just say just have fun. Go have ice cream before you have dinner. And I know some of you are like, you can't do that. That's wrong, right? Why? The Bible doesn't say, thou shalt have ice cream before thine dinner. It doesn't say that. It's, don't do it every night, but I mean, you know, I can remember the first time I did that with the kids when they were young. We went out and we had ice cream before we had dinner. They didn't eat that well that night. It's okay. We had fun. We made a memory. It was good. It was good. Or maybe Ecclesiastes 9. I'll end on this one. Ecclesiastes 9.9 9 says, Enjoy life with the spouse whom you love. You see, we're coming together in these relationships. You know, it's important that we have date nights, that we have quality time together, that you spend time in, in private away from kids. That's a good thing, too. Make that happen and make that real. So how are you doing with your fun and play in the family and making memories and that quality time together? And here's where we're closing. Just take a few minutes. Oh, I have one more picture to put up there for you. Ah, there it is, family. Um, where's these areas uh, that we talked about? Maybe it's a strength. You say, we do well at this. How can you make it better? What's an area that we've been talking about right here? You say, oh, not so good. I can make that change. Maybe it's an attitude change. Maybe it's an action change. But I want you to just take a moment. Take a minute here. Think about that. How can I do that with my family, my my kids, my grandkids, nieces, nephews, whoever's around? How can I make that real?